Well, good morning again, everybody. Uh, man, I've been excited about coming this morning to church to speak to you. Uh, when Pastor Dave said, hey, Tom, would you uh, mind speaking today? Um, I've just been thrilled to be able to, I, I don't know if it's that post-Thanksgiving, like uh, all those pecan bars I ate or whatever, but I'm all fired up today. And so um, I, I'm just trusting that as you come and as you go, you'll, uh, you'll be inspired by what God has done and what God's doing in the life of the church. I, I come back to that phrase, God, uh, Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her, for us. God, God loves this church. God loves PNC. And when we read the scriptures, many times we read them uh, as in, for individual, individualized. But really, uh, many of the, the books in the New Testament, the letters were written to churches like ours. And so this morning, I want uh, to look at a passage of scripture that comes in 1 Thessalonians. And uh, it's written to a church. It's written to a group of people, not just individuals. My prayer is that as we look at this, that it will, it will spark uh, something in you and spark something in us that will, uh, that will carry on with us through this, uh, through this week. Um, anybody here, I guess it's because of Thanksgiving food and all that. Uh, I, I've kind of had food on my mind. But anybody here participate in a, in a potluck before? Uh, you know, church potluck, they used to call them covered dishes. I guess other people, other groups have. My experience with potlucks has always been through church. Um, but you, most of you, you younger people here, you know what a potluck is? It's like everybody's sort of, so supposed to bring something. So you have a, you have a meal and everybody kind of brings whatever they like to bring. And you just put it all on a table and everybody kind of walks down through the line and you get some really great stuff. Uh, and sometimes where I've been in churches, it's been like, okay, we'll supply the meat. And then everybody whose uh, last name starts with A to M, you bring salads and vegetables. And then everybody else, you bring desserts. As a kid, I loved potlucks because I knew there were going to be lots of desserts. But there's something about the, 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 the church that it, the services were great. But man, when I could come to the potlucks, they were I just look forward to those. And, uh, and there's a part of that that says, you know, everybody, so what do you bring into the potluck? And so today I, wanna, I, want, you to re I want to read this passage of scripture to you, but I want you to think in terms of potlucks. And what is it that God would have you bring to the potluck called the church? Okay, you got it? All right, I'm going to begin by reading in verse number 13 of chapter 4 in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. Okay? And you're going to go, this doesn't sound anything like a potluck, but stick with me, okay? All right. Here's what the Word of God says. Brothers, and I would say and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are still left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, angel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Does that get you excited? That's good news. Uh, the context of the letter was that this church in Thessalonia, they had some issues that the, they, they knew that Jesus was coming back again. They had gotten that. But some of the people had already died and they're going, wait a minute. Jesus is coming back. What's going to happen to the people who died? Are they going to get to be with Jesus or is it just people that are still left here? And Paul's reassuring me. He's encouraging me saying, church, get excited because if you die in Jesus, you're going to be with him forever. And if you're alive, you're still going to be with him forever. Isn't that good news? And that's for all of us today too. 
So now verse chapter 5. Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. We do not know when Jesus is coming back. Some of us have made it a hobby and a habit and it's kind of something that we like to study to figure that out. And that's well and good. But really, we do not know and will not know. Jesus is going to come back like a thief in the night. Um, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come to them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. That doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? That, that's, that, that's not any kind of potluck I want to go to. But listen to this in verse 4. But you, church, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons and daughters, children of the light, and sons and daughters, children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. Those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are, get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day... Let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us, church, to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. Man, that's good news. So, now I want you to think about potlucks. What is the body, what are people here supposed to bring to the potluck? So one of the things that we need people to bring to the potluck is confidence. We are people. We are children of the light. We are children of the day. Because Jesus Christ has come into our lives, we, are, uh, we bring a confidence because of Jesus. In this scripture verse, I, I want to highlight a couple really important words. In verse 9, this scripture, Paul says that God did not appoint us. He did not pick us. He did not call us. He did not woo us so that we would be, uh, so that we might suffer wrath. But he has wooed us and called us and come into this world for us so that we might receive salvation. So when we live out our lives, we do not have to live in the darkness. We live as children of the light and children of the day because Jesus Christ, this says, has died for our sins. And so somebody in the church, when we had the potluck, needs to bring that kind of confidence. In the midst of the stuff that's going on around us, who, who are those believers who are going to come and show up and say, you know what, I believe the church, I believe that I can come represent people that are children of the light and children of the day. And I have the hope and the trust and the confidence that God is with me. Anybody here ready to bring some confidence to the potluck? I love this phrase. Verse 10, he died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Don't, don't read too fast through those words. We will live together. That's not just me and Jesus. That's us. 
men and women of the light, men and women of the day, in the, in the midst of the darkness around us, in the midst of the threats around us, because Jesus Christ has died on the cross, because he is the victor, because he rose from the dead, because he now is seated at the right hand of the Father. We have this confidence in Jesus, not in ourselves. But we have this confidence in Jesus. We are children of the light. And we will be with him in heaven. But we will be with him right now. He is here. He loves the church. So, I don't know if you're an A to W in the alphabet or an N to Z, but somebody here needs to bring some confidence in the midst of the world that we live in. Well, here's another thing we need to bring. This passage is full of little practical things, uh, but I want to go to several of the ones that are just kind of that you know, that you realize, but in verse 16, 17, and 18, this little thing you could kind of just remember real easy. It says, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. The will of God for us individually, but the will of God for the church is that we Rejoice always. We pray continually. And we give thanks regularly. So who's bringing the joy to the potluck? Can you bring the joy? There we go. Rejoice always. In Philippians, we find that Paul is in prison. He's writing out of prison. And when he comes to the end of the... Uh, of the letter, it just spills out in, in, his, in his words. Rejoice in the Lord always. So the reality of it is the joy isn't just something that I magn manufacture inside me. The joy is the joy in the Lord. I have joy because Jesus Christ has so transformed my life and touched my life. Jesus Christ has come into the world. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. And when I get my eyes off of my little strength and all of my difficulties and my struggles, and I put my vision onto the Lord Jesus Christ, who died, who rose again, who's seated at the right hand of the Father, who's coming back. I can get joyful. Can you? There are some times when I come to church and I don't feel very joyful. Anybody here like that? Some of you today, you may not feel very, very joyful. That's why when it says rejoice always, I'm glad I have the church. Because when I don't feel joyful, there are going to be three or four other people there that are going to be joyful. And their joy is going to spill over on my, me and it's going to lift my spirits. So I may not come very joyful, but I may leave joyful because somebody else brought joy to the potluck. That's why we need you. You may not feel very significant. You may feel like you don't have a big part to play in the church. But when you come and you're joy filled, your joy will spill over. And by you being joyful, it will be contagious as we gather together. So who's bringing the joy? You going to bring the joy? The last week or so, uh, Brenda and Hope and I, we went to a, a high school musical. One of our friends uh, sisters was in the in the musical and we went we sat in row P and walked in and sat down and I'm sitting next to these people next to us and kind of nondescript just sitting there really didn't I said hello nodded but we sat there and what impressed me about the lady sitting next to me was at halftime at the not it was a, no I, you think in sports <laughs> at at intermission at the intermission I started smelling french fries and I thought to myself, no, 
I don't care what play you ever go into, you never get french fries at intermission. And I looked over, and this lady had smuggled in McDonald's. <laughs> and she was eating french fries, and so my opinion of her really rose right at that moment. <laughs> we watched the play. We didn't say anything. At the end, it was a, they did a great job. At the end, at the curtain call, the different people stood up. And at one point, this lady sitting next to me bolted out of her seat and started clapping and said, that's my grandson. I clapped. I said, he really did a good job. I didn't know which kid he was, but I knew that they all did a good job. So I just said, if I say that, I just thought, you know, here we are. We've been singing. Chris has been leading us in these songs about the glory of God, the, the glory of Jesus, the power of Jesus. And I just thought to myself, I can stand and, and, and give great joy to her grandson. But what about my father who so loved this world and so loved the church and sent his son into the world to die for my sins? And to forgive me and to set me free. And to give me a group of people that I can worship with. And I thought to myself, sometime I need to come to the potluck and be the one that brings the joy. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. So how about you? You're going to bring the joy to the potluck? I asked Chris to lead us. Just, I want you to participate. Let's sing Let's sing a song. We're going to sing praise to God. And as we sing it, this is your chance to bring the joy to the potluck, okay? Mr. Chris. So we're singing the song Ever Be. It's a song of just praise that the Lord is worthy of praise always and that every word of our tongue should come out kind of his praise in a way. Uh, so we're going to sing this chorus together. sounded great. I heard some of them. Were people singing? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> when you come to church, when you come to small group, when you're gathering up, there, there needs to be, the church needs to show up rejoicing always. So could you be one that brings the joy in the Lord? Because the church needs you to bring the joy to the potluck. Well, there's some other things. And I mentioned these three little things. Uh, rejoice, uh, be joyful always, pray continually. That one's always tripped me up. You mean I have to pray all the time? What if I'm in a meeting? What if I'm watching the Ohio State game? And did anybody see that game yesterday? Yes! Sorry to my Michigan friends. I guess we were saying prayers at the game in a different way. But, but does it mean that we're just praying? You know, what does that mean to pray all the time? Well, you know, praying is, is the idea that God um, wants to communicate with us and we want to communicate with God. Praying always isn't always just us saying stuff, but praying always is also being mindful of what God is doing around us. And prayer is something that can bring great confidence to us. 
and prayer in the church. I, I also like the idea that, you know, when, when I'm having a hard time praying, this says pray continually. Thankfully, I have the church that's praying. And there are people at the church praying. And there's other folks that are helping to remind me of what's going on in, in, in the work. And so when I feel a little bit let down or struggling, thank God that there are people in my small group that are praying. And you're praying. And so there are times in which we, the scripture just says, you know, just, just pray always. I love this quote from Pete Cazero, a pastor in New York City. He says, Jesus has a simple diagnosis for our powerlessness. Do you ever feel powerless? I know in leadership at the church, there are times when we feel powerless. You know what Pete says? Jesus had a simple diagnosis for powerlessness. It's prayer. How do we find the ability to help the world? Believing God enough to say our prayers. A little faith is a living thing. Jesus promises power that will take our breath away. Nothing will be impossible. If, I don't know if there's anything that everybody needs to bring to the potluck. I, you know, I thought, I was trying to think, is there something? I guess we all need a utensils. But I would say this is something that we all need at the potluck. We, we need it at our small group. We need it at our youth meetings. We need, we need the, this idea of prayer, this connection with God, this power of God that comes upon us. And, and the Apostle Paul just says, okay, guys, just, pray, just be praying. Just be mindful. Just be thinking. Just be aware. There are times when you do that kind of just as you're going along without having much to say. And then there are some times when you really, you focus on prayer. You take time. You get away alone and you pray. Uh, one of the things I love about the mark of this church is you'll see people praying all over the place. I I've seen people out in the foyer praying for one another. I've seen people here at the front praying for other, uh, other people. People in the parking lot. The, the idea is that, that the church, we need to be in the place where, you know, it's okay just to start praying for somebody. And so just pray. Uh, the, the fourth thing that I want to talk about that we need to bring to the potluck is this is thanksgiving. Give thanks in all circumstances, the scripture says. I love the quote from John Gordon. Abundance flows into your life when gratitude flows out of your heart. Abundance flows into the church as gratitude flows out of your heart. I've been so excited about this church. I'm so thankful for Puyallup Nazarene Church. I'm thankful for the people that are meeting in groups. I'm thankful for the people that are meeting in those groups and they're finding a need in that group and they're saying, hey, guys, let's rally around because we can help that guy out. I, I just talked to a lady this morning that said, I just found out that somebody's hurt and they're home and I want to get meals to them. How can I get their phone number? I'm so grateful that when we come to church and on baptisms, we're seeing people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in baptisms. I'm thankful that we gave out a hundred and some uh, Thanksgiving boxes. I'm thankful that we're doing the Christmas gifts. I'm thankful that we have people that have given and sacrificed for wells in Malawi and motorcycles in Malawi and churches in Malawi. I'm thankful to God that, that we have a refurbished uh, gymnasium, youth area, children's area, all done without having to take out a loan. The debt is being paid down. We have so much to be thankful for. We have people that are willing to serve in small groups and leadership places. And I just think to myself, oh God, for the church, thank you. Now, it's easy for me. I could also come and say all the things that aren't getting done. You don't know anybody that talks that way, do you? So who is bringing thanksgiving to the potluck? To the small group. To the worship service. 
How about you? Can we say, oh yeah, you're, you're the guy. You bring the Thanksgiving this week. I'm struggling a little bit, but I can count on you. You'll bring it, right? So, so who is it in the church? Will it be you? You see, you're not insignificant. You're necessary. You're needed. When you come with a heart of thanksgiving, it helps us, helps us all. So Chris, we got a, we got a thanks song, right? I think we better sing it. I think you're right. The scripture says we give thanks in all circumstances. I, I don't want to make this message seem like, oh, it's just all, you know, happy, happy, happy. Because sometimes we go through some tough stuff. But that's why we need the church. That's why we need one another. So that one of us, when we're going through hard times, it, it's somebody else that comes and can sing the songs of thanks and it, it begins to lift our souls and lift our heads helps us to see that we may be going through a hard time but but God has promised that there will better be better times to come this last week on sun last Sunday our Hispanic church had a potluck I got to come and uh, one of my favorite things that David Roach's wife makes is salsa. And she makes it hot. I love it. Hot salsa. It sticks with me. It makes me sweat. There are, there are physical issues that happen because of hot salsa. Hot salsa is life changing. Did you know that God has given the church, given you and I, His Holy Spirit? Present, alive, with us, right now, here. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is unquenchable? The Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be snuffed out. There is no power on earth that can take the Holy Spirit out. I, I've been amazed at the devastation of those fires in California. Do you know that if humanity, if humans could do anything possible, they would have stepped in there and stopped those fires. But those fires had a power that no human being could put out. So with the Holy Spirit in the church, God has promised us His Spirit that if we will trust in him he will unleash his spirit upon us as his people and i know we've experienced some of that haven't we you've experienced the work of the spirit you've experienced the power of the spirit you've seen god work in ways and all you can do is just drop your jaw and say wow i believe that that is what god wants to do in, in even greater measure at PNC. What do you think? The unquenchable power and life of God's Holy Spirit 
We long for that. We want that. Because we believe that the work of the Holy Spirit is the hope of the world. That the Holy Spirit working in our lives and in our church and in people's lives can literally, literally change people for eternity. Do you believe that? I believe that most of the time. I want to believe that all the time. Paul said, folks, you, we got to bring the Spirit to the potluck. Paul was concerned because he says, do not quench the Spirit. His fear was somebody, instead of bringing the salsa to the potluck, would leave it at home in the refrigerator. Paul, was, Paul wanted to see this Spirit unleash the cross the church and the world. So, you know what I think? There are two, a couple reasons why uh, we quench the spirit. Uh, one is is a is a um, is a lack of faith. It's unbelief. We struggle, and, and it's normal that we struggle against the idea that God can really do those things. That's why we need the church. That's why we need somebody to bring the salsa because if I feel a little unbelief in my own spirit, I need somebody who's there saying, you know, brother, you know, Tom, I just think God could do this. I just think God is powerful and able and the spirits. So I need to surround myself when I'm feeling kind of low and negative and I need somebody to help lift my spirit through the Holy Spirit. Do you, do you get that? That's why we need each other. That's why we need worship. That's why we need small groups. The other one is, is disobedience. We can stop the Spirit by, by, not, um, by not obeying. It's as if, as if I've got some really great salsa at home, and um, I'm going to keep it at home because I don't want to bring it, because if I bring it, you'll all eat my salsa, and I won't have any more. So I say, no, I'm not, oh, no, not going to do that. Uh, this uh, Thursday on Thanksgiving Day, near my house, they have a turkey trot. And a couple of guys from the church, a couple of my buddies were over there. And so I, uh, I took my dog and I walked down to um, Brenda said, hey, why don't you take the dog down and see, see the turkey trot and you can see your buddies. And so I went down there. I had the dog on the leash. I had my little bag in case something happened along the way. And something did happen along the way. So I walked down there, and I got to the turkey truck, and I watched the race. And on my way back, I'm about a half a block from my house, and I see my neighbor, who's incredibly reclusive. We see him, you know, maybe once a month outside. And uh, I saw him walk into the mailbox, and I'm about, um, I don't know, half a block away, and I've got a... I've got a bad wheel. I'm having a hard time walking. And um, I see him, and I, feel, I hear God prompting me, saying, you need to go talk to Ken. And I'm going, I'm a half block away. I can hardly walk. I got the dog. I got my bag. And you want me to? Okay. So I speed up as best I can, try to catch Ken at the mailbox. He's already walked into his house. I'm walking. He's my next-door neighbor. I'm walking there, and I'm thinking, I should stop and see Ken. I said, just wish him a happy Thanksgiving. And I thought, no, that would be the dumbest thing. I never talked to Ken. I never knocked on his door before. No, I'm not going to do that. As I got closer, God saying, you need to go talk to Ken. So I walked up. I rang the doorbell. He had just gotten in the house. He walked to the door. And I've got my bag in this hand and my lease here. And uh, I said, hi, Ken. I just want to uh, wish you a happy Thanksgiving. And I was prompted to shake his hand. And so... <laughs> I transferred this. I shook his hand. He kind of looked at me strange. And I just said, I want to thank you for being a good neighbor. Thanks for fixing the fence this year. And I walked away and I thought, oh, that was the dumbest, most awkward thing that I could do. And he saw me transfer that bag over to this hand and shake his hand. I'm sure he must have gone in and had to, you know, I had all these negative things. But, but I, I did that because, you know what? I didn't want to quench 
the Spirit. I've been praying for Ken. I've been trying to figure out since Bo's been here, how do I help connect people with Jesus? And I thought, this is one small step, but if I don't do this, when God's nudging me, I'm going to miss something. So pray for Ken that he'll forgive me for shaking his hand, but who's willing to make sure the Spirit shows up? Finally, I know we're getting late, but the last thing is, and this is probably one of the most important ones that I see, is that um, I believe that we who love Jesus... We who have been followers of Jesus, we need to bring optimism to the church. This letter ends in verse 24. There's a couple other verses. I, I, didn't, I decided not to talk about how we should all greet each other with holy kisses. I'm leaving that. You can talk about that later. But before that, this says this awesome promise Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. Faithful is he who calls you, and he will do it. That's, that's thinking very optimistically, isn't it? If he calls the church to do something, he's going to do it. If he asks you to do something, he's going to do it. There is this optimism that somebody around here, we need to bring to the potluck. Now, in that passage, we realize that God wants to transform lives. He wants to take people who've lived in shame and failure and in their ugliness and their broken relationships and in their addictions, this scripture says that the God of peace wants to take people like that and make them clean and make them holy and not just do the outside, but through and through. This mighty God wants to come and transform people's lives. Do you believe that? Because this scripture says, faithful is he who calls you, and he will do it. Anybody here want to bring the optimism to the party? God help me, I want to be that guy. What would happen if we all brought optimism? Whew. So, finally... What will God have you do? I wanted this message to be fun. Memorable, but fun. Because God, God's up to something. God wants us to be a part of this movement of God, this unquenchable life of God. How should we respond? And individually, um, what are you going to bring? What will you bring to your small group this week? What will you bring next Sunday? We're starting Advent, the coming. Uh, what, what are these qualities? What, what are you going to bring? Because if you'll bring those, I just believe God is up to something. He's going to do something special in our lives. You're really willing to bring something? May God help us that we'll uh, take these words and be encouraged because faithful is he who calls us also will do it. Will you stand with me? I want to say a prayer and then we're going to sing a great song to, to seal this in our minds as we leave today. Father, uh, thank you uh, for these words. Um, just as I hunger for great turkey and dressing and dessert... 
I hunger for you. Father, this church, you've, you love us. You've blessed us. You've enabled us to do many, many things. But Father, we hunger for the fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit that would impact us with confidence and with praise and thanksgiving and joy and prayer and power. So will you just encourage us to do our part, to follow you, and to see all that you will do with our lives together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.